Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, our God, and nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, what a good way to begin our morning together. And uh, thank you to my son, Matt, who was on the piano. And thank you to Tim Harper. He's our technology department and uh, running the the uh, camera for us this morning and we're glad that you're joining us and that you're a part of this uh, of this live streaming part of our worship here at Trinity at the Eastern Gate and we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus this morning we're going to begin I'm going to share a few announcements with you uh, we're also going to say something about the offering and then I'm going to get right into the message this morning I'm excited about the message that the Lord has given me to share with you and uh, I'm glad that you're able to uh, tune in and to enjoy this from uh, the comfort of your living room or wherever it is that you're, uh, you're at this morning uh, as we are observing social dis distancing uh, through because of the uh, virus situation and the health concerns. Uh, but uh, we're excited that the Lord is faithful. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. A few announcements, and of course it's obvious that we're closed down for our services this week. There won't be a Wednesday night worship and word. We're canceling those for right now. Uh, we may pick them up a little bit later uh, after uh, Easter or maybe in the summer months and because uh, that was a great time of fellowship together. Um, also, we're not going to be having service next Sunday either. We'll also be doing the face uh, the the live book or live stream Facebook uh, uh, opportunity here as well, sharing that um, until further notice. Uh, we're hoping that this will uh, be changed. The situation in our nation and in our community will change, uh, but we don't know. So for right now, until further notice, uh, consider all of our services, all the activities here at our church canceled uh, for for the time being. If we are able to reopen and get things back to somewhat of a normal schedule, we're looking at switching our time of worship to 10 o'clock on the first Sunday in April. That'd be April the 5th. It'll be Communion Sunday. It'll also be Family Sunday. Uh, and it'll be the Palm Sunday uh, before, at the beginning of Holy Week, before then the Resurrection Sunday celebration on, on April the 12th. So those are just so a few announcements. Before I do the offering, uh, let me just simply say that we've had uh, several questions on ways to give during this time uh, in which we've had to close our, our building and uh, uh, cancel our services. Uh, you can always uh, give through uh, dropping off something here at the church if someone is here in the office, uh, or you can use the kiosk there in the lobby. That would also work. If you're using the kiosk in the lobby, uh, there we are charged a 2.75% fee uh, on the square donations. You can also give online uh, by way of PayPal uh, to administratortrinityflc.org, uh, and you can send that to us uh, as a payment. Uh, if you do it by payment, uh, we're not charging any fees for that. If you do it by donation, there's a fee that is charged. Or you can send it by mail. Send your check by mail, uh, 6389 Blacklick Eastern Road, Pickerington, Ohio, 43147. Uh, or you can set us up as a vendor uh, in your bill pay uh, at your bank. Uh, you can send the money that way. Uh, and sending the money that way, uh, it, it will not be able to deduct anything from your account, of course. Uh, but then you you can make that decision. You can send that money when you want to do that. Uh, there are no fees involved when you use that method of, uh, of making financial giving uh, to Trinity at the Eastern Gate. So I just want to pass that on to you and, and uh, our offering this morning. I'm just going to hold up the basket and put my offering in it. Uh, but then I encourage you to uh, faithfully give and support uh, your church during this time. For our scripture le reading this morning, I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, beginning in verse 36 through 50. 
Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both. Which, now none, now which, one, which of them would, will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not kissed, stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been give, forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Will you pray with me? Lord, this morning as we uh, uh, come to you by way of live streaming on Facebook or as we come to you in our homes or wherever we are uh, listening and watching this, this uh, broadcast, we just invite you, Lord Jesus, to come into the house. Come into this place. Come into our hearts, O oh God. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. Make your word and your spirit uh, transcend all obstacles, all barriers, all uh, uh, distances, uh, and draw near to us, O oh God, and touch our hearts and give us your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. The title of this message uh, that I'm in the series on what makes a great church and the title of this message is a great church practices the presence of God. Well, being caught up in our homes uh, last night, Beth and I uh, sat down for a few minutes and and I was watching TV. I was watching the news and I got rather uh, uh, tired of watching the news and decided instead to uh, flip the channels and I came across a program that I've watched before and I really enjoy called Undercover Boss. Maybe you've seen that program yourself. The CEO and the owner or founder or boss uh, in the, uh, goes undercover, disguises himself or herself, going undercover to visit and work among his or her employees. Uh, at different stores or factories or businesses. Uh, two things happen in the program. Two things happen. Uh, one is, is uh, the boss usually learns some good things about his business, changes his or her needs to make uh, his, his or her business uh, better or improve. The other thing that happens, though, is that the uh, that Learn, the, the boss learns something about the people. Uh, he, he learns whether they understand the mission. He, un, he learns as to whether they are taking good care of his business. 
at the end of the program or at the end of the uh, of the experiment uh, a few of the employees that the boss encounter now again he's he's been disguised he's undercover they are not aware of who it is that they have been working with he brings a few of those employees together at the corporate office or for a meeting and then there the boss or the CEO uh, reveals his or her true identity now again they didn't know the boss uh, had been among them uh, the whole time they hadn't recognized him because of or her because of the disguises that they were the boss was wearing but then when he reveals him or herself to them, you can almost see in their minds as they are trying to remember uh, what they might have said or done uh, in the presence of the boss. Uh, and uh, you can, whether it was right or wrong, finally at the end of the program then is the climax of the show. The boss then affirms one-on-one -on -one with those employees he affirms the good things that he or she learned and saw in those employees and then the best part about it is then he generously rewards them generously will rewards them well in in watching the show uh and i've seen it before but last night i was struck by it again uh i i always wonder uh if, if I was that employee, uh, would I recognize the boss? If I was that employee, would I, would I change my behavior? How would I act? Uh, how would I do my job as uh, in the presence of the boss, though not knowing that it was the boss? Well, the, the spiritual lessons here are abundant. Uh, one of the things that we could say in spiritual terms is, would my faith match my actions? Would they, would they line up? Would I say I believe and, what I, and how I act, would they line up? Would I, would I practice the presence? Would I practice the presence? Would I walk the talk? You see, a great church practices the presence. Well, going to our text then in Luke chapter 7, uh, it begins with Jesus, the boss, if you will, being invited to dinner in the home of Simon the Pharisee. Uh, Jesus is invited uh, into the house or into uh, the home of Simon. Uh, and think about that for a moment, that, that when we invite Jesus into our home or into our situation, Inviting Jesus into this coronavirus uh, situation in our community, in our nation, or maybe in our own household. And how would that work out? And now, Jesus would come. Jesus was God in disguise. Jesus would be under, he would be God undercover, if you will. Simon the Pharisee, uh, he, as a Pharisee, he was a strict Pharisees were strict religious sect of Judaism. Uh, they were the religious elite, if you will. They were legalists. They were very focused on the on the smallest uh, minutia of the law of Moses. The name Pharisee literally meant the separated ones, and they were. They considered themselves separate from the common and the ordinary and everyday people. They were, they were set apart. They set themselves apart uh, under the law of Moses. Well, why did Jesus, why did Jesus, uh, why was he invited into this house? Uh, why did Simon do that? Well, some have speculated that maybe Jesus was invited by Simon the Pharisee as a way of entrapping Jesus and maybe getting him to say some things that, that uh, they could use in an accusation against Jesus. I think maybe though Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus uh, into his home maybe for another reason, maybe for self-promotion. Uh, you see, uh, Jesus had become very popular 
He was the teacher. He was the preacher. He was the healer. Had done miracles. And maybe, maybe Simon the Pharisee uh, uh, was doing this to promote himself in the eyes of his own community or in the eyes of his own of his own village that he lived in and uh, and and so maybe he did this for self promotion and by the way that that's a religious spirit that's a religious attitude uh, that that we see there if that was Simon's reason and and we see that sometimes in churches uh, too often times, I'm sure. Some people profess to be Christians, but it's all for show. Uh, it's all for a self-feel good. It's all for patting themselves on the back. It's all for their own self-promotion. Yes, they go to church, but their walk doesn't match their talk. Well, whatever Simon's reason for inviting Jesus, Jesus came. He came into the house. Uh, where he had been invited, uh, his presence came into the house uh, of Simon the Pharisee. And uh, uh, Simon, though, did not recognize who Jesus was. He didn't recognize who he had invited into his house. In verse 37, though, the story goes on. A woman who had lived a sinful life in that town... Uh, she had a bad reputation. Uh, everyone knew about her. Uh, she learned that Jesus was eating in the house of, of the Pharisee, Simon. She was not invited, uh, but she decided to invite herself and to find Jesus uh, and to uh, approach him if she could. Uh, it was very common in that day that when a dignitary or a celebrity or somebody special was be invited for this dinner, uh, uh, of course, the, the townspeople, though they were not invited, they could come and listen in at the windows or the doors of the house, or they could even come inside and stand along the wall. They were not permitted to sit down. Uh, but stand along the wall. They were. They could get in on the on the uh, uh, on the special moment that was taking place in that home. And this woman joined the crowd that came into the house of Simon the Pharisee, who had invited Jesus there for dinner. The woman brought probably the most expensive thing that she had or valued: an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, that had probably been a gift, or maybe it had been the wages of her sinful life. I mean, her sinful lifestyle. Uh, it's, and, and think about where that jar, how she ac acquired that jar, that, that alabaster par, uh, jar of perfume or oil, that pure nard. Very, very, very expensive that she had, and she brought that to with her to encounter Jesus. Listen to me, my friends. When we're talking about bringing an offering, when we're talking about giving to the Lord, it's not about what you bring. It's not about the amount. It has more to do with the heart. It has to do with the sacrifice. It has to do with the sacrifice that we make in giving it. It's, a, it's that kind of, it's, it's not about the what, it's about where did it come from and why are we giving it to the Lord. I can remember as a small boy going to church with my grandmother in St. Mary's, Ohio. And, and I can vividly remember one occasion when we got out of the car to go into the church. My grandmother pressed, a, a, I think it's probably a nickel, might have been a quarter, but it was a coin. She pressed it into the palm of my hand and she said, always, always have something to give when you go to church. Always have something to give when you when you go to church. Listen, that's a key. I believe that's a key to to worship. That's a key to the very heart of worship. And that is giving. What are you bringing? Well, again, let's go back to the woman. Why did she come? 
Uh, many would have been uninvited to, uh, to see this guest and stand along the wall, but, but she was probably not not invited. She was, it was, it was even more so. Uh, and, and so when the crowd came in, uh, no doubt uh, Simon uh, could see the, the big response of the people filling his house, but then he noticed her. He noticed her coming in. And I believe at that point Simon became very uncomfortable. Simon was very, very self-focused. Everybody else made him feel good, but seeing her here of all times, I'm sure Simon felt very differently about that. She had come not to eat. They had all come out of curiosity. She had come with a, with a hope and a longing. She had come aware of her own needs. And no doubt, I believe, the Holy Spirit drew her there that day. She was drawn by the presence. Well, she inched her way along the wall, making her way closer and closer to where Jesus was reclining at the table. You see, in that day, people would uh, lay down on pillows uh, and uh, at the table, their feet would be outstretched behind them. And Jesus was reclining out on a pillow and probably conversing across the table with Simon, uh, his host, Simon the Pharisee, his host. People, though, as the woman made her way closer and closer to Jesus, I can picture the people sort of making room for her, getting out of her way. Uh, she, she may not have been dressed appropriately for being in public. Everybody knew she had lived a sinful life in that town, and nobody probably wanted to be associated with her. And so you can imagine them making room for her as she inched her way along the wall until she found herself standing at the outstretched feet of Jesus. They ate laying on these pillows with feet stretched out behind them, and now she stood at the very feet of Jesus. One thing is, I use my imagination, I can picture Simon having trouble carrying on the conversation. Because out of the corner of his eye, he was watching the woman and trying to talk to Jesus. And yet watching this sinful woman getting closer and closer. I imagine Simon was, was distracted by her presence. But she was attracted by Jesus' presence. As she stood there at, in his presence, uh, she became overwhelmed. I believe the Holy Spirit was touching her heart at that moment. Maybe this was the first time that the woman had ever felt or sensed the presence of the Lord. Maybe this was the first time that she'd ever felt real love. Maybe this was the first time that she ever had experienced. She'd never known a peace like this before. She'd never known an acceptance like this before. Maybe she'd never felt this way before, the presence of God. And it overwhelmed her. And she began to weep quietly. Big tears ran down her cheek and off her chin and fell and splashed onto Jesus' dusty feet. And Jesus seemed not even to mind. Listen, I, as a pastor, I've done a lot of uh, funerals uh, over my career. I, I, I don't often cry at funerals. I can feel the emotion, of course, but I, I, I usually can control controlling my emotions. Why? Because I cry in the face of hope and joy. 
I don't, I, I don't cry necessarily in the grief of, of, of loss, but in hope and joy. I cry in the, when I sense God's generous goodness and love. That touches me deeply, and I'm not alone in that. I think a lot of us are. Joy, joy is a response of our heart to the presence of God. Pre joy is not the same thing as happiness. Happiness, we get happy over circumstances, but joy, joy is e evoked. Joy is, is uh, touched and stirred by the presence of God. I don't mind telling you that when I watch that show from time to time, The Undercover Boss, I oftentimes cry in that last scene of The Undercover Boss because I, get, I catch a glimpse of the of of the gospel i catch a, a glimpse of hope and joy and generosity and giving and it touches me it touches me deeply well the woman made a mess on the feet of jesus she suddenly realized what she was doing the tears were splashing on his feet she quickly knelt down and began drying his feet with her hair she loosened her hair uh, and and dried his feet with her hair. She humbled herself. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, he said that a woman's hair is her covering, it's her glory. And this woman unloosed her covering and her glory and wiped the feet of Jesus dry. She humbled herself. And here's the second key of worship. The second key to the heart of worship is humility. Getting ourselves out of the way and humbling ourselves at the feet of Jesus. Well, then again, she caught herself uh, in where she was and realized what she was doing. But then the presence of God overwhelmed her again and she just began kissing his feet. Over and over and over again as she wept, she kissed his feet over. Can you see this happening? Can you imagine? Oh my goodness, what a moment of worship was unfolding here. It's interesting that the Greek New Testament word for worship is the word proskuneo. Proskuneo, and it literally meant to kiss toward. To kiss toward. It's, it's not all that far away from when we talk about blowing kisses. You know, when we FaceTime with our grandchildren in Nashville or in Tennessee, before we, before we close the phone call or the, uh, the FaceTime call, we blow them kisses and they blow us kisses. Well, that's worship. Worship is blowing kisses. Think about this for a moment, that, that when you worship... It's not you. It would be very appropriate to blow a kiss to Jesus. Because in a very real way, worship is about a greeting and a welcoming with expectancy. Uh, it's, it's about greeting and, and, a, and, and a, uh, uh, a welcoming. Uh, we are welcoming the pre when we worship, we are welcoming the presence of God. As we blow him a kiss, you know, seriously, I, we may do that on a Sunday morning when we're all back together again. We may just stop and at the beginning and blow kisses to the Lord, because that is what the essence of worship really is. Sometimes when people say to me that they don't meet God in in the worship services, maybe it's because they've not prepared themselves. They've not gotten themselves into that position of expectancy. They didn't bring anything to give to the Lord and begin with a greeting. I've been placed, I've been met people, and maybe you have too, that you walk up and you hand, you shake their hand. We're not supposed to do that right now with the coronavirus, but when you shake their hand, have you ever uh, reached out to shake a hand and the hand was limp? <laughs> Have you, when, or when somebody is there, not only is their handshake very limp or they're aloof or they're distracted uh, in, and at the, at the very moment of greeting, they've, they're distracted and aloof and their handshake is limp. And how does that make you feel? Well, let me tell you how it makes the Lord feel. 
when we are not prepared for worship. One of the things that we started doing, and I really appreciate our, uh, our uh, sound and tech, uh, technology people turning the lights down low. Uh, Tim, Tim Harper and I have talked about getting our, helping our congregation cut, be ready. 15 minutes before worship starts, we lower the lights, turn on some soft music, and, and we get down on our knees. We pray, and uh, the visitation and, and welcoming, take that out into the lobby. But in here, we get ready to welcome the Lord. And that's a very different thing to prepare our, to, to build the expectancy. We're going to meet with God. We're going to worship the Lord. Something is going to happen here. And we get ourselves ready uh, to offer to him our offerings and our ourselves. Well, then the woman, the woman poured the perfume. She brought her, her, her costly sacrificial gift of the alabaster jar of perfume and she poured it onto the feet of Jesus and the fragrant oil, the pure nard, filled the house. It filled the whole house. The presence of the Lord filled the house through the fragrance of that oil and through that gift that the woman had brought. Jesus was moved by her worship. Simon was distracted, of course, uh, and disgusted by all of this. But Jesus was moved by what the woman had done. You see, the religious spirit and the religious attitude of Simon, he was disgusted by this, this show of love for Jesus. That's when Jesus spoke up in verse 40 and said, Simon... I've got something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, Simon said. And Jesus then went on to tell the story. Two men owed money to a moneylender. One of them owed 500 denarii. The other owed 50 denarii. A denarii was equivalent to a day's wage. So the one owed approximately a year and a half of salary. The other one owed approximately a month and a half of salary. But neither could pay and so the money lender canceled the debt of both. Then Jesus asked Simon the question, which one will love the money lender more? Well, I suppose the one with the bigger debt canceled. Jesus said, you are correct. You are correct. Let me ask you a question. Who had the bigger debt? Was it, the, was it Simon the Pharisee or was it the sinful woman? Neither one could repay the debt. Neither one could uh, repay the money lender. And so he canceled both. Jesus said to Simon, correct. You've answered correctly. And so Simon, Simon uh, uh, though had uh, a debt that his also needed to be forgiven just the same as the woman but Simon was not aware of his debt but the woman was then Jesus turned toward the woman I, I love this this sentence too Jesus turned toward the woman but he continued to speak to Simon he said do you see this woman that was sort of a strange question because Simon had not taken his eyes off of the woman just about since she entered into the house and inched her way along the wall to get to the feet of Jesus. Simon had been watching her, but Simon had not truly seen her. Simon was missing the point. Simon was missing the presence. Let me ask you a question. How many times do we go to church and we miss the point? How many times are we in the presence of the Lord and we miss the presence of the Lord? How do we know that Simon was missing the point and missing the presence? Well, look what Simon failed to do. Jesus pointed it out and said, Simon, when I came, no water was provided for me to wash my feet. This woman used her tears and wiped my feet washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. 
When I came, you did not greet me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. No oil was provided for my head, Simon, but she poured fragrant oil and perfume on my feet. Somebody has said it this way. You know what the definition of a fanatic is? A fanatic is someone who loves Jesus more than you do. <laughs> sometimes when we worship him, and when, sometimes when we're in the presence of the Lord, that we can get carried away very easily. Why? Because the love that we have for him causes us to do some really odd things at times, but it's an expression of our worship of the Lord. Well, the woman, she did all of that. She washed his feet with her tears, dried them with her hair, kissed his feet, poured perfume on his feet as in response to the presence of the Lord. She was practicing the presence. And listen to me. In your living room, wherever you're watching this broadcast or listening to this, uh, this Facebook broadcast, uh, you can practice the presence today, right there in your home, wherever you are. Invite Jesus to come into your home and worship him. Worship him. She did all of that in response to the presence, and you can too. And Jesus said her sins were forgiven because she loved much. And her faith saved her and healed her. Well, the other guests at that, in the house also missed the point. They became indignant. They missed the presence. They did not recognize who Jesus was in the house. Listen, my friends. Jesus can show up anywhere. God's presence can come anywhere. Some people may say, well, uh, uh, if he's everywhere, uh, why do I need to invite him? Well, I think we need to invite him, mainly to open our own hearts to him. Some people may say, well, uh, I don't find God in my church or I don't find God in my circumstances. Well, invite him. Open up your heart and seek him. Humble yourself. Offer, bring an offering to him. Get yourself out of the way and see what happens. Because God's presence can show up anywhere. Anywhere? Yeah, even in this corner, coronavirus season. Even in the trials and testings. Even even in the good and the bad times, at home or when we've been laid off or social distancing or even in sickness and in fear, Jesus will go undercover and he shows up in some amazing places when we will open our hearts and receive him. Don't miss him. Don't miss practicing the presence of God. Let me share a quick story in closing. This one, again, was found on Facebook. Uh, uh, my wife, Beth, pointed it out to me and told me the story about a man who was standing in a grocery line uh, with a few items that he was going to buy. But there was a big, long line behind him. And the man behind him uh, uh, had a basket full of, of things. Uh, but as uh, he struck up a conversation, the two men struck up a conversation with each other. Uh, the man with a few items, he noticed that the man with the big basket full had dirty shoes and he was obviously a construction worker. And as they talked, he told him he had four kids at home, and, uh, but that he had just been laid off from his work primarily because of the coronavirus and the and the health concerns and the economic uh, upheaval that was taking place. And, and so it came time for the man with a few items to pay for his uh, items. And as he brought them to the cashier, he leaned over uh, to the, the railing there and said to the cashier, he asked her if, if he could use some hand sanitizer. 
he knew her and he asked her if he could use his hand sanitizer. And, but then he whispered to her and said that he would like to pay for the man's groceries behind him with the big basket full of items. Oh, and also, by the way, I'd like to buy some some gift cards for uh, groceries for an entire month for the man. Well, the, the, he did that quietly and no one else heard it except the cashier. And so then he paid for his few items and then he left the store. When the man with the big basket came up there, uh, uh, the cashier told him that his groceries had all been paid for. Oh, and here are some gift cards for the, for the month ahead uh, for you to take care of your children and your family. Well, let me tell you, the presence of God showed up at a grocery store line. The, the presence of Jesus showed up there uh, in, the, in an unlikely place because somebody had invited Jesus to come into the house and to make his presence known. Here are some takeaways, and these are the keys to the presence of God. Seek him out. Invite him into your house. Invite him in to whatever your circumstance, whatever the situation. Seek him out and invite him to come in. Secondly, bring him a gift. Make a sacrificial gift and give, giving, first of all, your heart to Jesus. And then thirdly, get yourself out of the way. Die to self. Get out of the way and let God's spirit take over. Let me offer this benediction blessing that I close our services out here at Trinity at the Eastern Gate. And receive it right where you're at in your home right now. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And give you peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.